right, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce Michael. So uh, Michael actually worked with Eric Pemikinsang for quite a few years, and he uh, he edited the translators of Sadhana's commentaries and texts, and uh, he also worked on quite a few uh, quite a few books that are fairly well known, as well as Blazing Splendor. He worked on the autobiographies of uh, Bharat Sana, Dojan Lingpa, Dilgo Kensa Rinpoche, and Adi Rinpoche. And after Michael met Choki Nima Rinpoche and Tulka Ergen Rinpoche in Nepal, for four years he spent three months in retreat at Nagi Gompa before Tulka Ergen Rinpoche passed away. And it's very special to, um, for him to have to share this with us. Um, he, uh, he, because one reason that I think is very special is that he received the empowerments and the, the reading transmissions for the entire Chokling Tursa from uh, Siki Chokling Rinpoche. So it's so wonderful to have you here, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, why don't you go ahead and share your screen? Okay. Everybody see that okay? Yes. Oh, everybody's That's on perfect. mute, so I can't hear any answers. That's perfect, Michael. Okay. So um, I've tried to put together a series of, uh, of images and a little bit of a narrative. I've um, selected pictures that not all of them are in the book. Some I've, are from outside. Um, some shots are good in the book, so I didn't see a reason to include them. And... Um, yeah, I better keep rolling because uh, we got to make it through. So, of course, this is Toko Urgen, who um, his um, given name uh, means blazing splendor, hence the name of the book. So I was asked what the connection um, is to Tara, since this is uh, um, people within the Tara program. Um, and I've thought about that. One, of course, is the obvious that it's inspiring to read the life stories of, of great masters um, for inspiration and practice, devotion, all of these things. And, but also, the stories, most of the stories uh, uh, that Togorjan tells come through his grandmother, Kuntruk Peldrin. And Kuntruk Peldrin, also she taught Togorjan um, the melodies, the actual original melodies of, of a lot of the uh, sadhanas and chants that came from Chogyal Lingpa himself, and how to make the tormas, many th uh, things like this, how to play the um, gamling and, and bone flute and things like this. And so the tradition through Toko Urjan really is, was dependent upon Kunchuk Peldrin and comes through her. And Kunchuk Peldrin had three meetings face to face in, in visions with Tara. So if you look in the uh, Dums and Umtral, the lineage prayer that we chanted, the line that, that refers to her, Pakme Jinla Bratna Shiri Dung, is actually means blessed by Arya Tara Ratna Shri. And Ratna Shri uh, refers to Kunchuk Peldrin. So as you can see, the, the entire Cholding Tersar lineage at this point is blessed by Aryatara. So this, of course, is Padma Sambhava uh, in a, a statue that uh, is considered that he blessed as a looks like me statue, a uh, lifelike statue. And he, of course, came to Tibet at the invitation of Chris and Detson in order to overcome the obstacles that were preventing them from completing uh, the monastery of Samye. And he had 20 disciples, which included the king and his, his princes, Yeshe Sogil and numerous others. And the second prince, Prince Lasse, uh, Lasse Mutra, I always get it wrong. I'm terrible with Tibetan names. Um, Mura, Prince Mura, Lasse Mura, was uh, reincarnated as Chogyal Lingpa uh, several generations later. And 
This is what makes Chogarlingpa a tertan, a treasure revealer, in that he remembers, a treasure revealer remembers their teachings they received from Padmasambhava in their past life. So treasure revealers, the main ones anyway, and authentic ones, are incarnations of one of the 25 disciples, close disciples of Padmasambhava. So this is a um, Tonka painting of Chagrilinga that was painted uh, while he was alive and that he put his handprints on the back of, stating that it was an authentic likeness. Uh, so the handprint says him. This is in the possession, as far as I know, it was, I believe it still is, together with uh, a, a set, actually, with Jamgun Control and Jamyun Chensei, and they all have their handprints and footprints on them. And uh, they're in beer, as far as I know, with Urdian uh, Tapio Rinpoche. So when Chogar Lingpo was young, he was, uh, when he was recognized, he was taken and educated as a young monk at Seishu Monastery in Nongchen. So um, as you can see, Nongchen is in Kham in the east of Tibet, and it's exquisitely beautiful, as you will see through the pictures I have um, from there. So this was the monastery where Jogur Lingpo was studied as a, as a kid. So, as I said, he was a treasure revealer. So he would have a list of, of uh, terma that were to be revealed. And many of his uh, were actual, what are called earth treasures. So they were actually taken out of the ground. They would have been buried by uh, Yasit Sogil and the 25 disciples after um, Padmasambhava left Tibet. And he, um, so this location is uh, Dakni Kalarongo. Um, and it's at the mouth of this gorge. This is a river running through the middle, can, through here. It's a river, the gorge. This is the south side. So this uh, face is facing north. And Colorongo, Dagni Colorongo, actually means um, the place that is always dark or the place in shadow. So it's actually the south side of the gorge that faces north, so it never sees sun. It's always in the shade. So we know that the, the cave where it was revealed was at the entrance right around here on the south side facing north because it was always in the dark. So this was where the Tuktrup Archi Kunsel uh, was found, one of the main uh, series of teachings in the Choling Teresar. Um, covers all aspects from Nundro right up through to the Dzogchen teachings of Trekchu and Togol, a uh, great variety of Yidam deities, uh, numerous tantras, and um, together, so what he would have revealed would be usually some statues or relics of various kinds, as yellow, well as a yellow scroll that had Dakini script written on it that would then be decoded. Uh, Turtons often had a uh, decoder sheet for their particular lineage so that they could read and decode the Dakini script. So these are actual words written in a, in a uh, secret language of the Dakinis. And so this would have been on a little yellow parchment there are various rituals um, uh, used. And then um, this particular one right here as a sample is from the Pemeningpogyu, the Padma Garbha Tantra that was known in English as the Lotus Essence Tantra. This is the Dakini script found at the end. But, excuse me, there's another one at the beginning. So then this would be decoded, this short line, into uh, either a sadhana, a tantra, or elaborate uh, a longer text or series of texts even. Yeah, the, they would also uh, find like uh, reveal statues and uh, other relics. On the left is a, uh, what's called a kutsab. So it's a representation, an accurate representation of uh, like a lifelike representation of Padmasambhava. Uh, that he is said to have uh, authenticated himself. 
I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that this is the one that was revealed with the Kunzong Tuktik, the uh, heart essence of Samantabhadra. Um, I actually, again, these both are in the possession of Urguntabio and Beer. Um, I've actually held um, this one, the Padmasambhava. And the one on the right is Dorje Drakpot Sal, and which is the Yidam deity associated with the Lamrim Yeshe Ningpo, which is known in English as the Light of Wisdom, which is the really the foundation uh, text, Tantra, it's considered a Tantra of the Tukta Parchi Kunzal, which walks you through the entire path from beginning right up to the end. Um, Togol, the consort practices, um, everything, like all the practices are contained and it's the basic manual. So that's the deity that um, is associated with that text, the Lam Rim Yashi Ningpo. And one of the things that makes uh, Chogyal Lingpa a Ter Chen, a great Tertan, uh, one of the last of the 108 great Tertans, is that he revealed the, what's called the Zogchen Desam, which is the three sections of the Zogchen. And um, it's rare in that it contains teachings and practices on all three sections of Zogchen, the uh, Semde, Longde, and Menakne. So this is uh, the lo Lotus Crystal Cave, Elma Sheldra, um, where uh, the Dzogchen Desam was revealed. And to give you a bit of uh, perspective, those are people. So you can see that's a rather large outcropping on top of the mountain. And here are some more shots. These come from uh, Helen from Scotland, who founded Gumde Scotland when they visited. So this is the same building we just looked at from another angle as they're hiking up. And this is the entrance to the actual cave, uh, the Lotus Crystal Cave. And this is inside the Lotus Crystal Cave where they've set up a altar for making offerings and such. Now the three sections are divisions of Dzogchen, um, are all teachings within Dzogchen, which just um, focus on different aspects. And uh, the first two, Sem Day and Long Day, um, all of basically all of the teachings of Dzogchen that came to Tibet basically come through Sri Singha, who was in India. He taught Padmasambhava, the Milamitra, and Verotsana, the great translator. And but he gave them different teachings essentially. And so this is Tonka is uh, by Ergen Galpo, just to mention. It's um, my own personal Tonka that I commissioned. So this is um, Verotsana. This is his um, Namtar, his, his biography. I had the pleasure of uh, editing it. Um, and so the, the image I, I recommend reading is a great story about bringing adventure story really about going to India to get the teachings and bring the texts and teachings back. And then he gets exiled. Incredible story. So he is the one who's responsible for bringing back the Sem Day, the mind series teachings, the original 13 uh, mind, mind series uh, texts, as well as the Long Day teachings. Here, uh, uh, this picture is him teaching Long Day to his um, disciple, I'm just going to get his name, uh, Pam Mipam Gongpo. And he was quite old. He was like 80 or 90 years old at the time. Um, and so he wasn't able to sit up uh, straight for long periods of time. Hence, he used a meditation stick with the uh, support under his chin so that he wouldn't uh, fall over and he could keep his spine erect. And in, in, you can see a meditation belt as well. And he would write the um, key points of Long Day on meditation stick as a reminder so he could read them. And 
then they, you would use the meditation stick. They developed the whole system to use it in different positions and you'd use different postures to press points. Um, so Semde is basically the view and very much um, an understanding of, of Buddha nature and the view of Dzogchen. The long day is the experiential, very much the experiential side to actually experience the, the empty um, essence and uh, clear, clear nature. And so it was very much oriented towards practice uh, on a more experiential level. And then um, this is, uh, uh, do I not have a picture of I missed a picture, but anyway, uh, Guru Rinpoche and Vimalamitra then were the ones, we'll have a picture of Vimalamitra later, were the ones who were responsible for the Manakte, the instruction section. Um, and there's two lineages, we'll get, come back to that, but but basically, so there were two lineages of Manakte, one that came through Padmasambhava and the Khandra Nintig, and the other through uh, Vimalamitra and the Vima Nintig, which were then um, uh, co brought together with uh, further commentaries and more practices by Longchenpa, creating what's called the Ninte Gyabshi, the uh, um, four mothers of, of um, the heart essence of the four, four mothers, uh, four mothers of the heart essence, the Ninte Gyabshi. It's the main Dzogchen collection. Um, so this is a, um, this is another one thanks to Helen from Scotland. And this is a lifelike representation of Chogar Lingpa, again, that he authenticated, that is in Natan Monastery in Tibet, in Kham. If you'll see some other Tonkas, if you look at various Tonkas, sometimes you'll see that they actually depict him. He appears to be buck-toothed. I always found it interesting because it's depicted here and in others you see pictures you see these uh, represented with the prominent front teeth. So this is um, when when Jogar Lingpa passed away uh, there were various um, tokus, uh, reincarnations, and the two main, there were two main seats, one in Natan, where that statue was from, and the other was in Sike. So this is Sike Monastery. As you can see, it's right on the, the Se River. I believe it's named this because it's Sike, and that's the Se Chu, and that's where the two rivers come together. As you can see, there's a confluence of the rivers. I, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty certain that's the case. So this is the third line. This is Toko Urjan's second son, the younger brother of Choki Nima. I took this photo in Austria in 2017, 2018. Um, there were two uh, Zige Cholings at the same time. Our Zige, as we like to call them, our Zige. And uh, this is the other Zige Choling who uh, was the one who actually was the one in Tibet and uh, was responsible for the monastery in Zige Monastery in Tibet. I believe he passed away uh, maybe two years ago. I'm pretty if I remember correctly. And then there was the Natan Choling, and this is the third Natan Choling, Pema Girme. Uh, he's the gentleman, the heavier set gentleman, uh, amazing llama, um, incredible, and had several incredible sons. Uh, this is one of them. This is Uyintabgyul. Uh, one of his other sons is Zigger Control. Uh, Ergen Tabyul was very much responsible for gathering the missing texts uh, and terma objects and relics and things 
um, from the Cholings Terrasar. Um, he would, did many trips to, to back to Tibet, uh, visiting people, collecting texts and items. And so he's uh, played a big role in, in recreating the, the entire catalog of the Cholang Terrasar as we now have it. Um, Nathan Cholang sadly was, died in a tragic car accident. Um, and it's very tragic in that his other son, um, who was close to the Karmapa, um, was driving. And um, uh, he's never forgiven himself for that. Um, so anyway, it, but it's very sad also because he was an incredible writer. He wrote, um, there's a few texts of his short sadhanas and things that are included in the Children Terrasar that are quite a, remarkable. Um, one on um, a guru yoga of Sri Singha, another of Jogir Lingpa himself with all the um, incarnations of, of Choling. Uh, part of the mandala, um, but as I was saying, his other sons are uh, his other son is Zigur Kondro. Um He also has his daughter as well. So when he passed away, he his the fourth name in Cholin, his incarnation was this young fellow, and when he was basically taken under wing, the Natan Monastery uh, is in Beer. Uh, and there's kind of a large compound where Ogun Tavgyal um, and Nathan and everybody live. And the monasteries are right next door to each other. And so he was raised there, largely tutored by Ogun Tavgyal and the others, Lama Putse and, and a few others. And when he grew up, he married um, uh, Tenzin Chuying Gary, uh, this lovely woman here. She is the daughter of Lodi Gary, who was the Dalai Lama's main man in the U.S., representing the Tibetan government in exile. And she is the sister of Pakhtuk Rinpoche's wife. Some of you may know Pakhtuk Rinpoche. They had a child. And that child was recognized as a Toko Urjin Yangtze. So when Toko Urjin passed away, the son of the first child of, of Nathan Choling and Chuying was Toko Urjin's reincarnation. So this is Patro Rinpoche, small statue of him. Patro shows up throughout Blazing Splendor at various points. Um, at one point, uh, I believe Chogar Lingpa himself uh, goes to the monastery where he's at. Um, Sewong Norbu and Wong Chuk Dorje, um, that, who were, were the, the sons of, uh, were also. Uh, Lingpa's sons, they were uh, disciples of uh, Patro Rinpoche. There's a very um, interesting story in particular about Wong Chuk Dorje, which you'll get to, in which he was uh, uh, had a large following, was, was supposed to reveal many treasures for the uh, carry on the tradition of the Chogyal Lingpa and, and reveal many treasures. And he uh, went and saw Patro and was so impressed. Patro wandered um, just from place to place and spent a lot of his time just with one attendant living out in the forest. And he lived a very simple uh, life of a yogi. And um, Wong Chuk Dorje was so inspired by this, he gave away all his possessions, all his yaks and horses, cut his long, beautiful hair, and um, uh, just wore a, a, a rough um, robe made of, you know, with goat skins and stuff and came back with like one yak and uh, one attendant. And, um, and that was uh, considered 
to be the re- one of the causes for his, he went shortly thereafter, his health declined and um, he passed away not long after. And for somehow they blamed Patrol for this, his following Patrol uh, for this. So Patrol, I, um, his biography, this book here that Matthew Ricard put together, I put it up because it's one of the most inspiring, wonderful books you could possibly read. Patros was the real deal. He, he had, uh, like I said, it, it's an amazing read and I highly recommend it. Uh, he had two main disciples, Patro. One was Shakya Sri. There's a chapter dedicated to Shakya Sri. Um, uh, Teresi Tolku was a disciple. And there's a very funny story uh, involving where Teresi Tolku was at an encampment again. Shakya Sri didn't have a monastery. He would was nomadic and his encampment of followers would just follow him around. He was a true yogi. Um, people were real practitioners. If you were a Maha, he taught both Mahamudra and Dzogchen. If you were Mahamudra, you went to one side of the encampment or the valley and practiced and got teachings. And if you were a Dzogchen practitioner, he went to the other side and practiced Treksha and Togo. And uh, Togo Arjun, I don't know if it's in the book, but uh, he tells a great story where they would they would run a thin, they would be in rows. Meditators would all be in rows meditating. He had a strict um, um, schedule. You would get up, have breakfast, meditate for hours, then have a short break, meditate some more, have lunch, more meditation. And when they were doing like trek show with their eyes open, they would put a string uh, with like uh, um, colored powder on it some pigment like coal or this, um, or I don't know if it was like our Sindura, and put it just beneath, so it was just under your uh, eyelids. So it was running right along or uh, under your nose. So if you started to nod off and your, your head drooped forward, you would get the powder on, and then the meditation master would just need to walk down the line, and he could see if you'd fallen asleep or nodded off and got distracted. And then he'd give you a berating or a beating for... Uh, um, going to sleep so very tough meditation uh, there so he had he so this is uh, uh again a wonderful book of uh his life and teachings um, i just threw that in so if anybody was inspired they could read read that and sebong nobu tells the story about being at the encampment, a very funny story, very strange, in which a man comes through with a zombie. And he's headed as a benefactor who, when he died, wanted, had asked to be, be cremated in India, returned to India on sacred ground. So he was walking, instead of carrying the corpse, he reanimated it and had it carry his luggage. So when he got to the encampment of uh, uh, Shakya Sri, with Se Nogu was there, he, uh, the corpse drops to the ground, the bag drops, nobody's allowed to touch it. And where he was headed was here, the Cool Grove Charnel Ground, just outside of Ogaya, which was one of the eight great charnel grounds, um, which was one of the main locations to practice Chu, the practice of cutting, which Tok Origin's father, Chimmy Dorje, was a master of. So this is the location where the Cool Grove Charna Ground used to exist. That chapter is really, that's a wild story. And I always remember Togor's and telling it to us up at Nagi Gompa because the uh, power went out one night when there was maybe six of us uh, there. I remember, um, and when the power went out, it, it was kind of, we just had one small candle. So rather than um, do anything serious, Togor's and started telling basically scary stories. And that was one of them. And there was another one about Chime Dorje doing his Cho practice in a charnel ground and um, monkey heads falling from the sky all around him while he was practicing his Cho with his drum and everything. And uh, so, and I remember afterwards when we were done, it, I mean, they were really like, you know, really good, like scary stories and the, like almost pitch dark with this little flickering candle in, in Tulk Origin's little room up in Nagi. And Bob King at the time was staying out in the retreat cabin that was outside of Nogi Gump a little bit. And he had to walk along a little forest trail that went along the, the side of the mountain 
and there were like you know um, leopards and there was a possibly a tiger in the area and stuff so we just spent like you know an hour or more listening to these like ghost stories essentially these really scary stories and bob's like got his little flashlight thinking oh god i gotta like walk all the way back there through like the dark right so uh good test of the fearless zogchen yogi um so Two of his uh, famous disciples were Mipam Rinpoche, a great scholar um, known for a very uh, famous commentary on the Guya Garbha Tantra. Um, he also wrote the Shower of Blessings, the sadhana practice for Shakyamuni Buddha that uh, is practiced at many of the Gomdes and, and um, Rangju Neshe centers. Dharma houses and stuff. Um, he wrote many others, and he he was a great scholar. He also wrote um, um, verses of realization and things. And so I thought I would quickly read you. If, I, hopefully, I'm not going to take up too much time. But uh, a little verse um, for of Dzogchen, the condensed meaning of mind. The meaning of the incredible vastness of innate empty Rigpa is perceived directly by following the Guru's oral instructions. So why try to produce lucidity when utter lucidity is naturally present? Your original empty nature does not require clinging to emptiness. So when uncreated Dharmata naturally arises within you, free of effort and fixation, rest, in that spacious state. Attachment to any artificial view or meditation naturally dissolves. This is Manjushri, so do not seek him anywhere else. And there's Tokorja. So, We'll move to Tok Origin's life story. He was born on a trip, uh, basically, to central Tibet. And near Samye, he was still just an infant, very young. And he got quite ill. Um, and nothing, the doctor or nobody could help. And he actually stopped breathing. And they took him to um, Samye where there was a small um, statue, I believe, of, of um, Padmasambhava uh, that was very famous for, for healing and this. And you typically you would take some water that had been blessed by the statue and you would like, you know, if you, had a, if you were sick or that, you would take some of this blessed water. And, but he was, at this point, was not even breathing. It was a lifeless um, body. So they just took him in front and laid him in front of the statue, very small statue, and um, prayed for the blessings. And he uh, started breathing again and recovered. And it was always, they always felt it was due to the blessings of this statue and the blessings of Padmasambhava, of course, which is what the statue was representing. Uh, this is the view from above Samye. So Togorjan was then recognized as the incarnation of Guru Chowang. This is a statue of the original Guru Chowang, who was from the early 13th century, early 1200s. And he was a main propagator of the Terma tradition, uh, defended it, um, wrote treaties on how to recognize, you know, um, discern true Terma, true Terms from the false and things like this. He also revealed numerous very important Termas, Lama Songdu and things like this. We don't have any pictures of his, Toku Urjan's uncle, something Gyatso, who was also his root guru. But uh, he was considered to be 
a the manifestation of the Milamitra in person, which is also um, stated in the Damsa Nantral, the, the lineage prayer that we recited at the beginning, um, you know, where it actually states, you know, um, uh, in the Milamitra manifest in person, something got so. So this is a Milamitra. From this is a uh, Zong Sar Chensei's um, tonka of the, the for the Jetson Nintik. This is just one aspect of the tonka. So something else has two main practices were the Kunzong Tuktik, the heart essence of Samantabhadra, uh, which is a complete uh, set of teachings from Nundro right up through Dzogchen Togo, and it uh, includes the Yidam practice is a Shitro practice, a practice of the 100 uh, peaceful and wrathful deities. So this is the Tonka for the Kunzong Tukti. And his other main practice was the Jetson Nintig, and that's Jetson Sange Wongchuk in the middle and the Millimetra above his head. So the, the, these two practices come back throughout and um, why these two practices? Essentially, the Kunzong Tuktik comes through the Padmasambhava lineage, the Guru Rinpoche lineage I've mentioned earlier, and summarizes it, condenses it into a concise form. And the Jetson Nintig follows the Vimilamitra lineage and condenses it into a similar form. They're actually quite different, the two practices. One's more yoga-based. Yoga uh, more of an Anu Yoga um, practice. Very different. Samigatso uh, was close to the 15th Karmatha, him empowerments and advising and vice versa. And um, when the 16th Karmatha was young, they had trouble teaching him. He didn't like studying and tutors. They had a lot of problem with tutors because he didn't like them. And something got so was known as a very stern, imposing figure. And so they, they sent the 16th Karmapa to study with something got so. So that's how Tok Origin met and became befriended the 16th Karmapa because he knew him from when they were young. Uh, this is the Tolku, the reincarnation of something got so. Yeah, he lived in Tibet to Nongchen. Um, so when Tolka Origin was about eight years old, when he was old enough, or younger, I actually, he must have been, uh, when he was old enough that he could, could read and write, uh, he was sent to Gebchak Gompa, a nunnery in Nongchen, where something Gyatso was residing at the time uh, to study and get teachings from something Gyatso. So this is Gebchak Mo. Gompa, very famous for its nuns, who are very, very strict practitioners, um, very devoted, who did great uh, tumo. They did chom cho and tumo were two of their main practices. And they would walk and after doing their tumo retreats in the winter, they would go out naked and circumambulate the entire um, monastery uh, retreat center and uh, naked in the snow, cub draped in wet shawls and dry the shawls on their backs in like minus 40 weather in the you know, deep snow. These are two nuns in their meditation boxes at Kim Chan. Uh, when he was about nine years old, his father, Chime Dorje, was residing at Dechen Ling. So he was uh, sent over to spend some time with him. And from then through his teens, uh, he would go back and forth between Dechen Lingpa with his father um, and various places wherever something Gyatso was, but mostly at uh, uh, Fort uh, Lotus, no, where was it called? Um, Fortress Peak which I have a picture of coming up. So as you can see, he, he had very uh, fond memories of uh, his time at Dejan Ling because it's so beautiful around there, as you can see. 
Um, so this is a view uh, on the way to um, Lachum from the Fortress Peak. So I believe that's Fortress Peak. Guru Chowong lived uh, uh, at Fortress Peak as well. Um, so, something Gatso was called the, the king of Nongchen's son was quite ill. Something Gatso was called to do some ceremonies in order to uh, prolong his, the child's life. And that was when Adi Rinpoche met something Gatso for the first time. Uh, Adi Rinpoche. Uh, something so, tutor is good friends with something got so and so he um, then uh, got teachings and considered something got so one of his main gurus and he when something got so came to give the tuk trip arts like kunzel over a period of a month he was still quite young and toko urchin was act uh, was something got so's attended at that time and took a liking to the young Adi Rinpoche and would basically act as his babysitter. So they would, he would make him little, he was very good at sculpting and stuff and he would get um, Zampa and instead of making Tormas, he'd make little like animals, flower animals. They would carve little wooden sculptures and things, uh, give him piggyback rides, give him rides on his shoulders and things. So they bonded when they were quite young. So that, Later, I had the privilege of meeting Adi Rinpoche in 1997 when he gave teachings in San Francisco. And we were very impressed. And I was with Eric. And he um, later, um, he was a Drukpa Kaju, and Sokni Rinpoche is a Drukpa Kaju Lama. And so later, a year or two later, Eric Marcia, Eric and Tara Goldman, uh, Eric, uh, Danny and Tara Goldman uh, went with Sokni to get teachings uh, from Adi Rinpoche, including teachings on Tara, uh, the, the triple excellence. And Marcia asked him for his life story. So I um, um, made book on Tara practice, um, primarily with the teachings from Adi Rinpoche that they received then. And Marcia also got his life story because he spent 25 years in a Chinese uh, prison camp. Um, it's an incredible story. His, his uh, um, attempted escape and why he gets caught and then spending 25 years in a, a Chinese prison camp in which he showed no uh, ill will towards the Chinese whatsoever. Incredible. Highly recommend. Uh, more shots of the countryside in the area. So finally, Rinpoche takes his, uh, has to take responsibility of his monastery that he's um, um, supposed to be responsible for. Uh, he's very resistant to it because um, he wants to do retreat, but this is Lachab, the monastery that he was responsible for. Uh, countryside. Whenever the Kamapa passed through, they would uh, get together. Um, and he would go, Tokorjan would go to Zirpu in outside of Lhasa to visit him. Give, they also gave him empowerments like the Dzogchen Day, some empowerments and things like this. Um, so he was a close advisor uh, and guru to come up. This is Karse Kontrol, the 15 Karmapa's son. He was considered the greatest um, Kaju uh, Lama of the time. And when he gave the Rinchen Terzo in Lhasa, he, he sent word, because he was giving it to all the main Kaju Tokus, and he sent word for Toku Origin to come as well. So Toku Origin went to receive the entire Rinchen Terzo the precious treasury, the treasury of precious terma that John Control had collected. 
after they were done, he spent some time in retreat up at um, the, the Lotus Garuda Fortress. And at this point, he had a consort, consumdation, and she was pregnant. And it was here that Chokinima Rinpoche was born. Then he goes back to La Chub. He wants to go into retreat uh, at the um, Fortress Peak, but a local politician also wanted to go in retreat there. So he pulled rank on him and Tolko Arjun had to settle for doing his retreat in the retreat room at La Chub. This is the very retreat room that Tolko Arjun did uh, extended retreat. Somewhere along the way, a uh, second child was born. And I lo love looking at these early shots because the larger one is Chokinima Rinpoche and the little skinny guy is Choling. And when they got older, it's kind of reversed, whereas Choling became a, a bigger uh, fellow. But in these early shots, he's always a wonderful little, little thin rake. So um, he spent time, sorry, I have to look at my notes. So during his last trip to Lhasa to see um, the Karmapa, he came, he brought the Kunsangdechen and the two boys. And when the Karmapa went on pilgrimage to India, Toko Urjan went up and spent some retreat time in the moon cave at Drakirpa. And it was there that he had vision, a dream, a very vivid dream of a wisdom dakini um, who told him what was going to happen in the future uh, involving the Karmapa and the Dalai Lama. And when and told this to, to other people like uh, Dujum Rinpoche, um, I think Dogo Chensei as well. Um, they, you know, kind of shook their heads because it, you know, said what the, that the future wasn't right for Tibet. Um, the Chinese were already there, but uh, it wasn't clear that it was going to be as bad as it got. So it was after that that Togo Urjin, um resolve to leave Tibet because he really didn't like the Chinese. So while he was in uh, Lhasa at that time, he met Zongsar Chensei Choki Lodro, the, uh, one of the five um, tokus of Jamyan Chensei, the great Chensei. And he also met Chacho Rinpoche, Dujum Rinpoche and Dogo Chensei. This is young Dogo Chensei, uh, probably around that time. And it, we can't um, overlook how important Dogo Chensei is to the Jogu Choling Tersar lineage. He wrote many of the of the sadhanas, composed some commentaries, manuals, empowerment manuals, um, on and on. He even decoded with, with Teresi Tolku, decoded some of the Dakini script and the Termas. So uh, very, very close to our lineage. Again, wonderful autobiography, particularly the um, uh, reminiscences, the, the recollections of his wife and attendants about, you know, how they met and uh, different things, but, you know, just a real personal view of what he was like. And he passed away the year before I first went to Nepal, 19, he passed away in 1991. I first went to Nepal in 1992, so I never had the pleasure of meeting him, but his, he, his reincarnation was the youngest child of Chogyur, of Ziggy Choling, 
and Daichin, his consort. Um, so Dogo Chensei was reincarnated as Toku Urgent's grandson. And that's him there. This is Toku Urgent with the great Dujum Rinpoche. He became the head of the Nyingma school. He got the empowerment for the Dzogchen Desum from Toku Urgen. He'd received it from Samtin God, so parts of it, but not the whole thing, and wanted the incompleteness. So he requested that Toku Urgen give it to him fully in, while they were in Lhasa. And this fellow here on the left is Trolshik Rinpoche, who was a heart son of Dogo Chensei. He came to the Gomde, California, when it was first, uh, in the first year, uh, and blessed the land. This is Dujan at his um, uh, place in Sikkim, in Kalimpong, surrounded by a credible um, gathering. So in the center is, I'll go very quickly, Dujan Rinpoche. Over here on the side, uh, facing the screen on the right, is Trolshik Rinpoche. Far to the left is Minling Trichin, the great uh, uh, head of the Minling uh, monastery and lineage. Um, this is, um, I'm told, is Taklung Zetral, young. Bomta Kempo is over his other shoulder here. Uh, this is a, apparently a great uh, Nakpa Golok Serto Rinpoche fellow with the beard, and here, kind of hidden in there in the second row, is Kongyu Rinpoche, who is the father of uh, Pema Wongil and Jigme Chensei Rinpoches, and Mingyur Rinpoche, uh, Dogo Chensei Rinpoche recognized Mingyur Rinpoche as his reincarnation. And the young monks in the front, the only that I've been able to get uh, identified, I'm told this is Bakar Toku. Bakar Toku. This is Chacho Rinpoche when he came up, visited Toku Urjan up at Nagi Gompa, Kusong Dechen, Toku Urjan's uh, wife. And this little guy here is a young Pakchok Rinpoche. So Toko Urjan escaped to Sikkim. He had trouble convincing others to go with him, including his own wife and brothers uh, and her family. So he himself uh, went to Gongtok, uh, had a benefactor who was a student of um, something Gatsas. And um, then he sent word for Kusong Dechen to bring uh, the boys and belongings out. So then they came. Chokinima here remembers riding in the back of a, a truck, like a, a cube truck, you know, um, like a, a transport truck, and riding in the back in the pitch dark and all bouncing around in the back of the truck and stuff because they had to hide from the Chinese in order to escape. Oh, what happened there? Oh. Uh, Jaman Kensei again, Toku Urjan visited him because uh, he was staying for 25 days uh, in retreat in Gongtok nearby. So he would go visit him every day. Uh, he bounced around a lot, Toku Urjan at that time. He hadn't settled. He would go between Bhutan, Sikkim, and Nepal. This is uh, the early days of um, Oda. And he had a student of uh, that he knew through some a student of something else. So it's uh, Tashi Dorje, Lama Tashi Dorje from Newbury, um, whose daughter then became Tok Origin's consort later, and is the mother of Sokni and Mingyur Rinpoche. Um, when he was in Bhutan, when Tok Origin went to Bhutan, he took advantage of the time. He, uh, to study, get teachings from Bumta Kempo, 
who is a very wild llama. There's a great chapter on Bumpta Kempo, very entertaining. And he held um, Kempo Nokchung's hearing lineage, a very important, famous lineage of um, Dzogchen that was given one-on-one -on -one over like a, pretty well a year, uh, a very long period of time. And you couldn't proceed to the next step until you had practiced and realized uh, the attainments of that step before you got the next teaching and you did it one-on-one -on -one with your teacher. So he went to get these, but he wasn't able to get the whole thing. This is Kempo Nakchung. Because he wasn't able to get it in completeness later, he received more of it from Nisho Ken. And Nisho Ken then also wrote two important commentaries on Toko Urjan's Guru Yoga, the Guru Yoga of Simplicity, that he entrusted to Pakchuk Rinpoche. Uh, uh, Tokinima and Choling were sent off to Rumtek to study and get an education, where all the young Tokus were at that time. And the Togo Urjan was all planned. He was actually packed and ready to go, to go into retreat uh, in Nepal, to go up to uh, Yomo. And Kamapa arrived and said, no way, you've got to handle this legal matter over a monastery at Swayambu and take care of for me. And that legal battle ended up taking nine years and then became trapped, let's say, in, uh, in Kathmandu. And then he put him in charge of Nagi Gumpa. Uh, when the boys graduated from Rumtek, Kamapa gave him uh, letters encouraging them to spread the Dharma and build centers and establish the Dharma. So they built Konying Shadrapling, Shokinima's monastery uh, in Boda. When they were complete, they uh, invited the Karmapa for the consecration. And there was other, many others, Shalmar Rinpoche, there's Tokorjan, Shokinima, various people. And they also met the king. It's a Karmapa meeting the king of Nepal. And here's um, Sokni Rinpoche and Minga Rinpoche and their mother up in Nagi. Uh, Kusong Dechen was older now. She spent a lot of time out in retreat and built, uh, oversaw the building and development of a Sura cave out in Parping, the sacred cave where um, Padmasambhava did retreat. And just below a Sura cave is a very famous self-arising, naturally arising Tara that's uh, slowly been growing out of the rock. So this is not man-made. This is Toko Urjan in front of a Sura cave. Sorry, I think I'm going long, but hey. So um, I I met uh, Chokinima and Rinpoche and Toko Urjan Rinpoche in 1992. This is uh, the Bodhis Stupa at that time. And this is Chokinima when I first met him at Kanying. We had a lot of fun. And one day after maybe a month, he said, I think it's good you go up and meet my uh, father. I'd heard of his father, but never met him. He was staying up in Swambu, um at the time. So he said he didn't speak English, so I'd need a translator. So get Eric and tell him next time he goes up that that uh, that Chokinima wanted me to meet meet him, meet Toko Urjan. So I found Eric and he said he was going up that afternoon. So he gave me instructions of how to find my way, get a taxi and then climb up. He had to climb up with about half an hour, 40 minute hike up Swambu Hill. Um, this is along the path. You go through some, in those days, some small 
Now you can drive up, of course, but in those days it was quite a hike. And you had to carry rocks in your pocket um, to fend off dogs because there were some uh, nasty dogs along the way. So Eric gave me advice to stick a few rocks in my pocket in the first part of the path because when it's going through the villages, uh, I might need them to scare off the dogs. Um, I would go in the mornings, uh, usually after that, I would go in the mornings bright and early at sunrise because Toko Arjuna was usually in retreat and he would only teach in the morning uh, early, like at, at 6.30. Um, so this is what it looked like uh, from up top, just when you were approaching the small monastery of Swayambu. He was building the small monastery for Mingyur Rinpoche at the time, no, for Sokni, and then Sokni um, developed it more. So this was it being built at the time. Um, Tok Urjan would stay up in this little room here, and we would get teachings there. And then it was developed into a full retreat center and stuff by Sokni, who then um, handed over the reins over the responsibility over to Mingir Rinpoche. So as my understanding is Mingir now um, is responsible for the monastery and swam. When I got up there, uh, this is uh, Lama Ozer. He's now a resident Lama in England, come to England. And he was Rinpoche's attendant at the time, always good for a laugh. I'd arrive cold and to that in the morning. So he would take me in his room and give me some hot tea and tell a few jokes while we were waiting for Rinpoche. Uh, this is a spectacular origin, of course, is known for giving the pointing out instruction. Um, that's what I received over a period of a week from him at that time. I'd go with two other people, a couple from Japan, who had requested it, and the, just the three of us. And we would go every morning for an hour and a half, two hours, um, and then go away, um, you know, having to practice or, or investigate things, and then come back and, and give our understanding and realization at that point, and then to Gorgon and carry on. So this is him actually giving the pointing out instruction, not my photo of somebody else's, but this is when he's actually pointing at the very moment he's pointing out the nature of mind. And this is a shot of him uh, showing how you just rest naturally in Rigpa. The next year I came back, um, he had now completed the monastery in Swambu, and so I was back in Nagigompa. So I went up and ended up staying in Nagigompa um, for th basically th for three months, uh, for as long as I stayed, as long as my visa lasted. Uh, his main translator, they had two translators, there was Eric and Andreas Kretschmar. German student who also lived up at Nagi Gompa. Hilariously funny guy, that's him in the glasses here. Um, he was also an oral translator. He lives in Cologne now, where he's originally from. Um, still does some translation and has a small group of, of students, but he brings Kempos and Lamas to give teachings and commentaries on texts and things in Cologne. Pretty lit, very laid back, wonderful guy. And the nun here is Annie Mayum. She's the uh, manager of Nagi Gopa. There is Andreas and Toko Arjun. The mala that everybody always envied is this beautiful amber mala of Toko Arjun. It was given to him by the Kamapa. And that's why he kept it and used it. And it turned out that it was actually just a cheap plastic mala from, from China. But because the um, Kamapa had given it to him, that's the one that he used. And this is during the Tibetan New Year at Nagi Gompa. Would have been, so it would have been 93 or 94, I'm not sure which. Probably 94, this would have been. Uh, Eric 
Andreas. This is Dr. Jurgen, a uh, student from Germany. Uh, and what's important is you talk virgin at the end. And this elderly nun is Saga, Toko Urgen's older sister, who became a nun. She escaped Tibet. It took a year on foot with a group of like, I'm not sure how many, but a, a group of women and children, uh, like carrying the, the way out and did the long way north into India uh, to escape. I always wanted to get her, her story and write it but she had a very thick Kampa accent and Eric couldn't understand it. So I could never find anybody who could understand her accent well enough to interview her and, and get her whole story. Lovely lady. Uh, this would have been 95. Uh, Tok Origin um, expanded. Nagi Gompa was building more uh, quarters for the nuns. You can see the nuns themselves would work on uh, the construction. Rinpoche sitting on top of the, the new building, I believe. Uh, those are the nuns that always do uh, uh, cho dance in the evening. This is up at Nagi. This is them doing the cho in the yard in front of the lock on. And in 96, um, I went back and, uh, the day I went straight from the airport, I was picked up by a taxi and straight picked up some supplies. Those days you had to drive up a very rough road and then you were let off and then you had to climb up the trail and then up some stairs and carry your bags. And I was walking up and I'd run into Andreas on the way up the stairs, although the law come and I, uh, um, Togo Urgen was sick at the time and there was a flu going around. So he was basically in isolation and weren't letting anybody in to see him. Um, so Andreas was telling me this as I was going up the stairs. And we looked up and right at that moment, Tok Urgen had come out onto the balcony to get some air and some sun and stretch his legs. And so we looked up and we waved and I, I dropped my bag quickly and prostrated three times. And this isn't a shot of it, but he did the exact same gesture out on the balcony, um, waving. Uh, but this photo was taken in his last days. And, um, sorry, uh, I, that night, uh, that was, I saw him, he went back in and like waved and bowed and, and we waited till he left. And then we carried on. I dropped my bags in my room. And, and then later after dinner, I, I fell asleep and there was a knock at my door uh, late at night. I don't know what time, midnight or so when it was Eric. And there, I'd heard like, like some yells and and various weird sounds and outside and Eric knocked on my door and said, "Have you heard Toko Origin has passed away?" So he passed away the very night I arrived. So this gesture that you see here, though it's not the exact one, is exactly my final memory of Toko Origin. There you go. Uh, 